Now let's say that you have a vial of plasma, and I'm actually going to label it as we go. You've got some sodium, some sodium floating in here, and you've got some anion in purple over here, and this could be you know, anything that really uh, binds to sodium. So if this is some negatively charged ion, maybe chloride or bicarb, those are the two most common. And you've also got, let's say, some glucose in here and maybe some urea, or what we call urea nitrogen, urea, as well. So you've got a few things floating around in the plasma, and someone asks you, well, what is the total osmolarity of the plasma? And you know that this is in units of osmoles per liter blood. Actually, I should write liter plasma to be more accurate, since that's what we're talking about here. So per one liter of plasma. And these are the units that we have to think about to answer this question is, what are the osmoles per liter plasma? So let's go through this, and I'm going to give you some lab values, and we'll see how, based on just a few lab values and really just uh, four of the most representative solutes or most important solutes, we can get a pretty close guesstimate of the osmolarity. So you don't actually need to know every single osmol that's in your plasma, you can figure it out based on four of the most important ones. So let's go with the first one, sodium. Sodium. And let's say the lab tells you, well, your sodium value, and I'm going to write the labs in kind of this gray color. Somehow that reminds me of the lab. Let's say they say the sodium value is 140 milliequivalents per liter. So how do you take that and make it into osmoles per liter? Well, our denominator is already okay, but Immediately, you can say, okay, well, 140 millimoles per liter is what that equals. And you know that because sodium is a monovalent, it's only got one charge, monovalent ion. So if it's monovalent, then that means that the equivalents equal the moles. And now that you're in moles, you can actually go across to osmoles. You can say 140 osmoles or milliosmoles per liter. And you know that because once sodium is in water, it acts the same way that you would expect it to act. It doesn't split up or, or anything like that because it's one particle. So it acts as a single particle, one particle. So if it's one particle, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have 140 milliosms per liter. And we've effectively gotten one quarter of this problem done because all we need to do is take the four different solutes that we've identified and add them up together. So we figured out sodium, and now let's move on to the anion. And the trick to the anion is just thinking of it as sodium. It's almost the same as sodium, but just the reverse. So we know that it's going to be 140. We're going to use 140 as the number here because our assumption, our assumption is that Sodium is a positive charge, and for every one positive charge, you need one negative charge. So we're going to assume that all the negative charges are coming from these anions, and these would be things like we said, uh, things like chloride or bicarb, something like that. So again, we don't actually get these numbers or even need these numbers. We simply take that 140 and we multiply by 2 and assume that the other half is going to be some anion. Now, we actually have to convert units still. We have to get over to milliosms per liter. And so we know that the anion is going to be monovalent, and that gets us to millimoles. And we use the same logic as above. We just say, okay, if that was millimoles, and it's still one particle, uh, meaning it's not splitting up when it hits water and going you know, in two different directions, in a sense, having twice the uh, effect we're going to end up with 140 milliosms per liter, just as before. So this is our second part done, right? So two parts are done. We figured out the sodium and we figured out the anion. Now let's go over to glucose. So let's figure out how to get glucose's units from what the lab gives us, which I'll tell you in just a second, into something more usable. So how do we actually get over to something usable? Let me actually help us switch over. There we go. Make some space on our canvas. So let's say we have our glucose here. And the lab calls us and says, hey, 
we just got your lab result. It was 90 milligrams per deciliter. It's actually a very, very common uh, lab value or common range for a glucose lab value. One thing we have to do right away is figure out how to get from milligrams to moles. And you know that this is what glucose looks like. This is the formula for it. So to get the overall weight, the atomic weight, you could say, well, let's take six, because that's how many carbons we have, times the weight of carbon, which is 12, plus 12, because that's what we have here, times the weight of hydrogen, which is one, plus six times the weight of oxygen. And that's going to equal, this is 72, this is 12, and this is 96. And add them all up together, and we get 180. So we have 180 atomic mass units per glucose molecule, which means, if you think back, which means that one mole of glucose, one mole of glucose equals 180 grams. And since these are way, way bigger than, I mean, this is grams, and we're talking about milligrams over here. So I'm going to just switch it down by 1,000. So one millimole of glucose equals eight or 180 milligrams. All I did was divide by 1,000. So now I can take this unit and actually use, uh, use our conversions. I could say, well, let's multiply that by 100 and uh, let's say one millimole rather, one millimole per 180 milligrams. That'll cancel the milligrams out. And I also have to get from deciliters to liters, right? So I've got to go 10 deciliters equals one liter. And that'll cancel my deciliters out. So I'm left with, and this 10 will get rid of that zero. So I'm left with 90 divided by 18, which is five millimoles per liter. And just as above, I know that the glucose will behave as one particle in water in solution. So it's going to be five osmoles, or milliosmoles actually. Five milliosmoles per liter. And that's the right units, right? So I figured out another part of my formula. And I'll show you the actual formula uh, at the end of this, but I wanted to work through it piece by piece. So We've done glucose now, and we're ready for our last bit. So let's do our last one, which is going to be urea. So specifically, the lab is not going to call us about urea. It's going to call us about blood urea nitrogen. And actually, it matters what this means. So what that exactly means is that they're measuring the nitrogen component of urea. And so they'll call you and say, well, you know, we measured it. And the value came to 14 milligrams per deciliter, something like that. So let's say that that's the amount of urea we find in our little tube of plasma. How do we convert that to uh, moles per liter like we did before? Well, again, it'll be helpful if I draw out a molecule of urea. So we have something like this, a couple nitrogens. And this is what urea looks like. It's a pretty small molecule couple nitrogens, carbon, and oxygen. And these nitrogens have an atomic mass unit of 14 apiece. So that's 14, and this is 14 over here as well. So what it actually measures, the lab actually measures, is just this part. It's just measuring the two nitrogens. It's not measuring the weight of the entire molecule. So all it's going to give you is the weight of the nitrogens that are in the molecule. So what that means is that we say, okay, well, that tells us that one, one molecule, one molecule of urea is going to be 28 atomic mass units of, I'm going to put in quotes, urea nitrogen. Because that's the part of urea that we're measuring. And that means that one mole of urea is going to be 28 grams of urea nitrogen. And because, again, this is much, much more than what we actually have, let me divide by 1,000. So one millimole equals 28 milligrams of urea nitrogen. So that's how we figure out 
the conversion. And I do the exact same thing as above. I say, okay, well, it's times, let's say I want to get rid of the milligrams, right? So one millimole divided by 28 milligrams, and that'll get rid of my milligrams. And I'll take, uh, let's say 10 deciliters over one liter, and that'll help me get rid of my deciliters. And so then I'm left with 14 over 28, which is 0.5. And then times 10, so that's five. Five millimoles per liter. And as I've done a couple times now, we know that it's the urea nitrogen, or the urea is gonna act and behave like one molecule or one particle when it's in water. It's not gonna split up or anything like that. So that means that it's gonna basically be five milliosms per liter. And so I figured out the last part of my equation. So going back to the top, we have sodium, and this turned out to be a total of 140, 140 milliosms per liter. And then for our anion, we had 140 milliosms per liter. And then for our glucose, we had five milliosms per liter. And for our urea, we had five milliosms per liter. So adding it all up, our total comes to uh, 140 times two plus 10. So we get, uh, if I do my math correctly, I think that's 290 milliosms per liter. That's the answer to our osmolarity. Our total osmolarity in the plasma is 290 milliosms per liter. Now, that was kind of the long way of doing it. Let me give you a very, very quick and dirty way of doing it. Let me actually make some space up here. You could do the exact same problem. You could say, well, this osmolarity, osmolarity equals, you could say sodium, sodium times two, times two, plus glucose divided by 18, plus BUN divided by 2.8. And that takes all of those conversions and simplifies it down. So if you ever get your sodium value, your glucose value, and your BUN, and you want to quickly calculate your osmolarity, now you know the fast way to do it.